My name is Simon Kiyoko. I'm the founder of you and I. I also work for the African Leadership University based in Nairobi, the new chapter called ALX. You uh, and I is a social enterprise that works with young people. We work with high school students uh, through mentorship programs and then I work with them when they join universities so that they go back to the high schools they were from to just develop the next generation of leaders. Being part of the African Leadership University, we are focusing on an MBA called the African MBA, which is focusing on Africa. And what we do, we look at African leaders who are doing something towards improving the continent. One of our uh, selected choices is Julie because of her focus on Africa uh, through her program, the African Dialogue, and also the Great Debaters. And we want to just get a few ideas from her on what she is able is how she's, she's able to use these platforms to engage with different African leaders. She has had a chance to interview great presidents uh, from the Africa and also uh, from other continents, and just want just want to get an idea of what goes behind doing such and what conversations they have with these leaders and how that can translate to the younger generation. Um, Happy to be hosting Julie today. Thank you. To discuss about Africa. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm here to talk about your passion for Africa. Right. Because I know you do a lot for Africa, and not just Africa, but also for young people, especially with the great debaters. So being part of the youth movement myself, I felt a uh, need to just uh, share your thoughts and just hear from you what is your take on Africa and where we're heading to, and why is there a big focus on the youth? as part of what I'm doing, because I'm part of the School of Business at African Leadership University. I'm doing an MBA and we are doing a version called the V3 model. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start us off by you introducing yourself, right. uh, but in an Pan-African way, and tell us why are you passionate about Africa? My name, as you know, is uh, Julie Gishuru. I, uh, I describe myself as an Afro-optimist. I am a passionate Pan-Africanist because I believe that Africa can only rise when it comes together. We need each other, we need to trade with each other, we need to uh, have more cultural uh, sharing, we need to appreciate each other as African countries, African communities, and in doing so, I believe we will unleash incredible potential for the African continent. I believe um, Africa is the wealthiest continent in the world right now, and I'm not just talking about resources uh, that are within our lands, and I'm not just talking about our wildlife. I'm actually talking about our people. Um, and if we could just get it right, this continent could rise. I, I am African, and that's why I'm passionate about Africa rising. Yeah. One of the big elements of what we do is leadership. So can you define leadership according to Julie and what it means to you? It's very simple. To me, leadership is love. And, and love is leadership. When you love, when you care, you go out of your way to do things to make something work, to nurture, to care for people, to open up opportunities, to mentor. I think, you know, too often we make leadership a very complex thing, but leadership has to start from a place of loving. When it actually matters to you um, that you serve people, then you make a positive difference. And that to me is good leadership. Yeah. I'm going to read uh, to you a quote because I mentioned about uniting Africa and mm -hmm. we look at uh, Kwame Nkrumah and this is what he said in 1963. There's no time to waste. We must unite now or perish. I'm confident that by our concert effort and determination, we shall lay here the foundation for a continental union for African states. Could you tell us a, a bit more about your journey in trying to bring the same uh, spirit of unity within Africa. Yes, I love to quote Kwame Nkrumah, and I, I love that you've done that here right now, because it just reminds us that for five, six decades, we've been on this journey of uniting Africa. You know, um, our independence generation knew that Africa needed to come together, but somehow they were not able to bring the continent together. So we have to give them credit for the fact that in establishing the Organization of African Unity, the OAU, and in coming together post-independence, and as some of the countries were still seeking independence, the one thing they were able to do for Africa was to ensure independence happened across the continent. So the OAU was not a complete failure. Um, they did 
see that through. However, we then became fractured as nation states. We were independent, but we were not united. And, and we now have the African Union in place, trying to, to again, once again, bring us together under what we call uh, Vision 2063. I think the world has conspired to ensure that Africa remains fractured, because a united Africa is a very powerful Africa. A united Africa gets to say, we're not comfortable with these global trade terms and we're not going to take them anymore. A united Africa is able to say, we've noticed all these resources being taken out of Congo. Who are you re removing these resources? Why are you removing these resources? End it now. A united Africa is able to say to China, great, come in, but come in on our terms. We work as equals. Say the same to India. And over the past two, three decades, we've seen the rise of China, right? We've seen the rise of India, and a united Africa would rise in a similar way. I think Africans just need to wise up, we really do, and ask ourselves, what kind of a future do we leave for our children? And if we can come from a place of love as African citizens and leadership, then we change our approach to the continent and we do come together. I hope that has answered your question in a very, in a very roundabout way, maybe. It has, and I, I want to just, uh build up on that mm -hmm. because this part of the v3 model which is virtue vision and values one of the values we talk about most is humility mm -hmm. and most leaders connect to humility especially when we, we need to admit a part in mistakes would you uh, would you tell us maybe a part of our, our failures as africans is there a part is there, is there a part where we're contributing towards the world conspiring uh, towards against yeah us. against us yeah that is a, it's a really interesting question. Humility is really critical. And that's why I talk about leadership and love, because love comes from a place of service and humility, and they're so interconnected. And I think we do really contribute to the situation we're in right now. And part of what I do in still answering your earlier question as well, is to try to drive a conversation that helps Africans to analyze our own behavior. I think it's absolutely critical that you know, humility is part of leadership, but also that we're able to use uh, data and information to identify the issues that we are facing and find viable solutions together. I uh, just want to know, I've had the chance of seeing you interview quite high profile leaders, and I know some of the leaders we talk about is the uh, presidents. Mm -hmm. So maybe just tell us uh, something interesting that happens behind the scenes in terms of before you going, going on stage or before calling them on stage, what kind of conversations do you have? Do you get, get a moment to actually either advise them from a leadership perspective because you're also a great leader? Do you get that chance just to interact with them on a leadership basis and tell them, Mr. President, maybe you could do this and this differently? And do they actually now hit to what you said? You know, I, I always like to tell people, presidents are people like everybody else. And I think the most important thing is to just understand, first of all, it's just a person, right? Um, with a serious role and responsibility. So yes, anytime I get a chance to ask a question, pose, to prod, to suggest, I absolutely do. And I tend to try to be a voice of the people. What have I heard people saying? What are they lamenting about? How do I communicate that? And very often, this is the interesting thing, very often it's the conversations that happen behind the scenes that could have far more influence than the conversation that happens on screen. And so even for anybody who does get come in contact with a policymaker, a, a key influencer, use that time wisely because even two, three, four, five minutes could make a huge difference. Um, I'll just finish off by saying that, you know, as I said, presidents are people just like you and me. We need to kind of stop and end this impression we have in Africa that, that they're demigods. They are not. Um, and the more we see them as people, the more we are able to ask for delivery, the more we are able to um, interact with them in such a way that ensures that there is a back and forth conversation about leadership. And that doesn't mean you abuse, because very often what happens is sometimes people think abusing or attacking yields results. With any human, if you come into my space and abuse me, I'll almost automatically create a barrier. So anything you say will be more removed from me than it was before. However, if you have a, a constructive engagement with me, where you're able to critique from a point of information, but in a civil manner, that I will listen to. And I think as Africans, we need to be able to develop 
that kind of engagement with our leadership, not just throwing stones or adulation. There is a middle point and we need to build that midpoint more. All right. Um, this this inter interesting segment uh, in the U.S. where the uh, leaders write a letter to a note to self, and Michelle Obama has done that, Oprah has done that, and they look back to their early age mm -hmm. when they are 10, 13 years old, mm -hmm. and they write back to themselves. So if we are to do a similar segment where I ask you to say some some words of encouragement to your 10 year old self, what mm -hmm. are some of the things you will tell yourself? For me, it would be simply to say to my younger self, thank you for your idealism. Thank you for your passion. Thank you for being stubborn, and I'll keep you alive forever. Yeah. I just want to ask you one last question, which is a more fun kind of question, okay. because I, I know you're a Game of Thrones fan. I am. Oh, <laughs> yeah. my God. <laughs> so which, which queen will you be? If you oh, <laughs> you I'm asked. Daenerys. Okay. I mean, un, unmistakably Daenerys. She's, she's, um, she's passionate. She comes from a good place, genuinely. She in her effort to be good, has made some very tragic mistakes, but she picks herself back up. Daenerys has walked through the fire and come out unscathed, unscathed, yeah. Um, she's a mother of dragons. She's a mother, she is, um, she's a breaker of chains. So when she found the Dothraki, you know, she released them and she said, you can choose to serve me or you can, you can go. She's amazing, and, and I love that she makes mistakes as well, um, and it would be her, yeah. Don't we all love her? Everybody's like, yeah, she's, <laughs> she's amazing. The spoilers made uh, hate us for this, but what, what do you think? Don't, listen, I haven't watched, I haven't watched the, listen, I haven't started watching the latest series yet. In fact, I'm like bird box like this, kind of trying to avoid all the spoilers. I want to at least get to season, uh, episode four and then start watching them. Yeah, I think Arya should uh, be uh, the queen of the north. Yeah, I don't really care what happens. I, Daenerys may even may even die as much as I love her. That's me, sacrifice. You know, the one I connect with may even die. But Arya deserves to be the queen of the north, and she should sit on the Iron Throne. That's what I hope will happen. <laughs> yeah. So um, I've had the privilege of working with young people, yeah. and this is one of the projects we do. Uh, it's called You and I. It's, uh, promoting the future working together. Okay. Uh, so maybe you, you just give us the last ones to the young people who are listening. What advice would you give young people? So I want to say to young people, don't tell your parents I said this. They don't know everything. Your teachers don't know everything. Your lecturers don't know everything. The leaders don't know everything. And in fact, in this world today, they may know less than you about the new world. That does not mean they don't have things to teach you. So learn as much as you can from them. Soak up what you can from them, but you can teach them too. But maybe the most important thing I want you to understand as young people is this is a challenging world. I want you to find out what you're passionate about, and I want you to live out your passion. Never let go of it. And that's why I told you at the beginning that older people don't know everything. You know what you love. This world needs a lot of help from environmental uh, conservation and protection to being wiser in, on digital platforms, which are opening opportunities, but also threats. So I just want you to be in touch with who you are, be in touch with your passion. And the final thing, know that you could do anything you want to do. You can achieve anything you mean to achieve. So go out there, choose wisely, and go for it. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.